Thank you very much, Jan Henrik, and welcome again, everyone, to uh, the IEC in Geneva on a bright and sunny day. Not unlike the weather over Yorkshire a little over 100 years ago in 1917, when two young English girls, 16-year-old Elsie Wright and her nine-year-old cousin Frances Griffiths, took the first of a series of photos purporting to show fairies playing in the garden of their home in Cottingley. They generated huge excitement and a lively public de debate about their authenticity. So much so that uh, experts from the Kodak company were asked to examine the photos and they could find no evidence that they were fakes. Indeed, so convincing were the photos that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, took the photos as proof that fairies really existed. Not sure what Sherlock Holmes would have made of that. Conan Doyle said so in an article in Strand magazine in, in 1920. Any modern day equivalents of the Cottingley photos would likely land on the computer of our first guest, Michael Wegner, who's a senior editor at the German public service broadcaster ARD. Michael is head of video and photos at ARD News, which produces Germany's most watched news program, Tagesschau. Through his involvement with the EBU, the European Broadcasting Union, Michael also works with his colleagues across Europe, including the likes of the BBC, France Television and the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation, to share best practices and exchange intelligence. And if new digital photos were taken of magical creatures in Yorkshire or anywhere else, chances are they would also end up sooner or later on the desk of our second guest, Professor Turaj Ebrahimi of the world famous EPFL in Lausanne. Professor Ebrahimi chairs the JPEG Standardization Committee, which has produced a family of standards that have revolutionized the world of imaging in the joint technical committee set up by IEC and ISO. Uh, Professor Ebrahimi, I'd, I'd like to, to, to start with you. Hello and welcome, uh, first of all. Hello, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I understand you've, you've, prefer, you've prepared a presentation for us. That's correct. So I'm going to share it and uh, maybe spend about uh, half an hour um, to bring in uh, maybe some of my uh, views, but also JPEG's take on this challenge of combating fake media. As you could imagine, the answer, the short answer to the can international standards help is yes. Now let's find out now more details about, uh, about this and some more insights. Um, uh, since I, I, I mentioned um, um, uh, fake uh, media, well, fake news, as we know, is, is, is really a very complex and very multi-dimensional phenomenon. Um, uh, JPEG comedy is, is, is not really, um, um, in its scope, uh, it's not uh, designed uh, to, to, to uh, address all the challenges and all the facets of this new phenomenon, but um, there are some issues in it that are um, quite closely related to, uh, to JPEG um, and what uh, the world of imaging and video uh, has, has created in the last few decades. Um, uh, maybe one issue to mention is that, uh, well, media and including fake media um, is, uh, is now increasingly produced not, not by just a few, uh, but almost by anybody. Any uh, human being on this planet can become a producer and of course has always been also a consumer of uh, media. And uh, recently uh, we see that um, this is getting actually uh, easier and easier. There are many reasons for that. Um, uh, some of the drivers are that uh, currently it's getting easier and easier to capture um, in a very, very um, simple and cheap way uh, uh, media in form of uh, images, video, but also audio, um, display them uh, almost anywhere, not only in specific places like the living room and the television set is, um, or at the office when you have a computer. Um, 
it's getting easier and easier to edit content. Uh, it's becoming even more effective. Uh, it's getting easier and easier to basically capture anything we want and produce anything we want and store them. And uh, the, uh, as I said before, uh, the channels for distribution are not any more uh, reserved for just a few uh, who could afford it, mainly corporations, but it's almost anybody using especially the recent uh, advances in social networks and the internet in general. Also, uh, there is a generational change. So uh, our children seem to be much more willing to create and edit content than their parents and their grandparents. And this also plays a very, very important role. Maybe the reason is because it's the devices and everything that is needed is there, but uh, um, it's, it's, it's definitely a phenomenon. The young generation are much more lenient to share um, content that they edit, they, con they create themselves. Of course, um, all, many of this content uh, has uh, those, many of these contents have people who are um, 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 generating them or their, their friends and um, even people they don't know in them. And uh, this is also increasingly exposing uh, almost everybody, uh, willingly or unwillingly. Um, uh, video surveillance uh, but the, uh, in the last few decades, but more and more now we have social media and people who actually are sharing their lives. And this is going to get even worse um, because of the um, way um, we see things are happening. Um, we're going to have more devices uh, that can capture and produce content like the Internet of Things even get a lot of information about ourselves through wearables that we are increasingly going to wear, uh, such as uh, smart glasses um, uh, that will have definitely also sensors. Uh, the fact that artificial intelligence and big data analytics is going to really make it much easier to search and to put some order and to target things. And through that also, um, target some of this um, content um, in in ways uh, that uh, that uh, that some want or some are desire uh, in form of recommendations um, and uh, through profiling uh, people uh, one way or another for good or bad um, feed them with uh, with a subset of this kind of content. Um, now, in that, of course, uh, all sorts of uh, modality of the content plays a role, um, but pictures especially uh, seem to have a, a very um, important uh, reinforcing uh, effect in, uh, in, in, in general. Um, uh, one of the reasons is because uh, you can actually hide messages in an implicit way by the way you edit uh, some of the um, you know pictures and the and the uh, visual information um, and also as humans we are wired right uh, to believe what we see in fact uh, in english there is a saying many other languages too that says seeing is believing uh, we don't say hearing is believing we don't say reading is believing we say seeing is believing because uh, images and humans uh, have a very, very special relationship with, uh, with images. We, we tend to, 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 to believe uh, when we see things more than, than we don't. And this has been used now a lot um, in, in, in many, many um, uh, environments, including the social media, where uh, often a picture uh, uh, by itself uh, or a video, a short video by itself has, has a huge influencing effect, like the one that Mike just said, um, of course. Um, uh, all these things are not new. Um, uh, let's not uh, uh, think that this, this all started a few years ago. It has been uh, for, for uh, there uh, forever. Uh, and as far as the imaging and pictures and video are concerned, since the invention of these um, and even sometimes before uh, through paintings and uh, 
and portraits, etc. Maybe the oldest example I would like to share with you is uh, is uh, the portrait of Abraham Lincoln. Um, this uh, this goes uh, back uh, two centuries, uh, but in fact, uh, historians say that uh, Abraham Lincoln was not really a very you would say uh, appealing type of person, politician, and um, in order to to give him a little bit more. Uh, appeal, uh, in fact, um, uh, his head was added uh, to, to, the, to the portrait of a, a southerner uh, politician uh, of the, uh, with the name of John Cullum uh, to give him a little bit more of a presidential um, uh, aura. And in fact, uh, this was discovered uh, much, much later uh, that this, this, the, the picture actually was fake. Um, throughout history, uh, in, um, in closer times to us, uh, Joseph Stalin has been has been known to um, uh, to to remove people from pictures. Uh, they were they were not anymore uh, considered as as his uh, close uh, allies. Um, we have even uh, politicians uh, in countries like Canada that have uh, that have uh, touched photos. Uh, in order to 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 send messages, um, for instance, in the case of the Canadian Prime Minister, in order to show um, a, a particular relationship, a more intimate relationship with Queen Elizabeth, um, the, the, the 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 picture, the part of the picture that uh, that was uh, with King George the uh, Sixth, was was removed. Um, and throughout history, I don't want to go for the interest of time to all of them, all the way to even much, much more recently, as months ago, we see this phenomenon of a lot of deepfakes being created by just everybody in a very, very realistic way um, um, on social media such as TikTok. Uh, the, the good example is the deepfake of Tom Cruise. Uh, and uh, these things happen um, through tools uh, that have evolved through, uh, through time. Um, in the digital world, uh, there are, uh, for instance, copy move, image splicing, in painting, and more recently, uh, artificial intelligence to generate completely virtual characters or deepfakes. I just want to give you a very, very quick examples of what they mean. A copy move is typically when you take part in the same image of something and you repeat it. Uh, you can do that with Photoshop or any, any even freely available version in, in, in very easy ways. Uh, here on the right, for instance, you see that on the back of the car, uh, there is no really accident, but you could take uh, some parts of, of the front and, and, just, and just move it and make it look as uh, the picture uh, actually um, um, is real and the back of the car has an extra and, and I don't know, go and fraud your insurance with it. Um, you could um, uh, do that from several pictures. So you could take actually uh, mainly individuals, but also objects from, uh, from different pictures, put them together and convey a different message that is, uh, that is, uh, that is, uh, that is meant. Uh, you can, um, uh, of course, uh, also nowadays, thanks to artificial intelligence and deep learning methods, it, it create people who do not even exist and change their, uh, their appearance um, by asking that they should be, I don't know, um, um, more um, of, of, of some style, uh, their hair should be of some style, they should have garments, etc. And this is, this is also playing a very, very important role in creating really situation that, that just uh, do not even exist in reality, even the people that are in these, in, these, in these situations are not real. And of course, uh, deepfakes is the most famous of, uh, among them uh, where, uh, where you can, uh, through and with the help of artificial intelligence, change content. And uh, this has been especially recently uh, used a lot uh, against uh, female victims, um, not only celebrities, but even just anybody in order to, um, um, to attack their integrity, um, to attack their image uh, in general. And uh, uh, believe it or not, there are even now completely um, freely accessible um, 
online services for free uh, that uh, that that allow you for you to 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 upload just a picture of a female, and uh, then it returns to you the, um, the 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 same person, the same picture, just that the clothes have taken off, and uh, of course. Uh, the, the, it's a, it's a guesswork uh, through machine, machine learning, but this can, this can of course has uh, devastating eff uh, effects on, on, on people, as you can imagine. Um, so I, I hope you agree with me that there has been a, a lot of uh, um, manipulation of the media, uh, uh, especially in form of uh, images, because it's, it's a very, very particular modality um, in, in the last two centuries, if not more. Uh, and uh, by the same uh, token, uh, you could imagine that people have been trying to fight these, um, uh, these, these manipulations uh, and, uh, and find ways uh, to, to counter them. Uh, this in general is referred to uh, as a digital image forensics. And uh, um, uh, without entering in details, because um, we don't want to get bogged down with, uh, with, with too much details, there are really two general approaches to do that. Uh, one of them is, uh, is really reactive, meaning that you just sit and um, once something happens, um, like the picture uh, example that Mike gave, um, of the fairies, um, um, uh, 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 well, you, you try then to go and, and analyze and, uh, and find out whether it is, uh, it is, it is genuine or not. Um, these reactive methods, of course, um, they, they are always in, in form of some sort of detection and they have still a lot of challenges. Uh, one of them is, uh, of course, you know, uh, it's very rare uh, to find a picture or a video that has been a little bit manipulated um, in order to, I don't know, denoise it or, 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 or make it look better. Uh, so, you know, it's very rare to have uh, pictures, at least in professional environment that come directly out of camera and just uh, are, are shown. So, so one of the diff difficulties is really to find out which, uh, um, which of these manipulations are of malicious nature and which one of them are just there to make things look better and uh, or, or for creative and artistic purposes. Um, also, most of these detectors, uh, they, they require to, be lear to learn or come up with a model for specific type of attacks, which means that if there are new attacks, if there are new type of um, approaches uh, that are for creation of uh, fake uh, content, well, you know, you either have to go and redraw some new detectors, or if it is based on learning, you have to you have to give uh, the the artificial intelligence system enough examples so that it starts learning that these are also um, um, uh, manipulated content. Uh, in general, um, especially in the in the case of uh, of artificial intelligence based solutions, it's a black box, right? So you don't know when it fails and why it fails, and sometimes you know it's uh, it creates problems. Um, and any any approach that just just is passive, reactive, you wait for the problem to happen and then you try to fix it, has this uh, problem of cat and mouse game uh, issue. Uh, where, uh, well, you know, if you come up with a detector, of course, people try to, to find ways to go around it. And then, of course, the, um, the detector has to be updated. And then, again, attacker tries to. So, so this is an, a, 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 a continuing game. Uh, and, um, and, and it's by itself as a challenge. And of course, uh, practically speaking, also, we shouldn't forget that even if technologies might exist, uh, it's not necessarily uh, adopted immediately, it takes time. Sometimes it's not even adopted for whatever reason. We, we know in COVID and vaccination, we have vaccines, right? It's not, it didn't, the adoption didn't happen over the night. And in some cases it's not happening at all. So the same problems exist also in terms of all these solutions that are reactive. And there is another approach which is more proactive. And this means that you, when you create a content uh, or capture a content, you actually proactively uh, try to annotate it in such a way that um, you could have a trail of its modifications. 
And um, this is referred to as a provenance uh, um, uh, approach. Um, and um, I just want to give you a very, very quick example of it. Uh, imagine you take a picture uh, uh, with a camera uh, and, uh, and, and just do some manipulation uh, with it because that's how it is usually done. Most people, if they really want to get the, and keep the highest uh, uh, quality, they, they, they keep it in the raw format, whatever raw format is defined in the camera. But at some point, once you have done your manipulations, you have to turn it into a widely used format that everybody can understand. And uh, for example, JPEG <laughs> is a good example. And uh, you, you, you create are, are already a very, very high quality JPEG, but then uh, when it gets distributed through uh, social networks, etc it can go through all sorts of modifications, right? Because some social medias, they don't accept that the pictures are larger than some size in terms of volume of information. Some they do not accept in higher in resolution than, than some limits, etc. So all these trails uh, are very, very important to, to, to somehow have in these proactive approaches. And uh, this is, um, also having some challenges, probably the most important challenges are the issue of interoperability and security, right? So these trails, you have to be make sure that they, they have not been themselves manipulated and some maybe not included or some modified. And uh, you have to have it in such a way that everybody can understand it. So you really need that. This is where standards are important, you really need to, to, to make these, this information available in such a way that it is interoperable uh, by almost by everybody. And this is what um, a number of uh, standardization uh, um, uh, committees have been looking at. Uh, some of them are more, um, I would say, industry standards like the Cotton Authenticity Initiative and Project Origin, which have recently, by the way, joined efforts, and the JPEG committee. Um, um, and this is what JPEG is, is actually doing. Let me before very, very quickly tell you what JPEG uh, is doing in this space and where it is heading. Uh, remind that the challenge of fake media is really multidisciplinary. And if you ask me, the technical challenge is not the most um, um, the difficult challenge. In fact, the educational and social challenge and the legal and policy challenges are probably even tougher. Um, just to give you an example, um, in fact, fake news spreads much faster than the truth. And the reason is because humans are, are, are have the tendency of sharing information without even verifying them. That, that really requires a little bit of education, a little bit of a um, awareness that 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 is that is not yet uh, fully there um, from legal challenge point of view uh, most laws are not um, really adequate or are not being used adequately to fight the problem of deep fakes in general um, um, and even uh, fake news um, we really need uh, a very very uh, in, um, significant effort uh, similar to what was done with GDPR to protect privacy, but uh, to um, against uh, misinformation and fake news and fake media. And this is, again, um, not yet completely there, although efforts are happening. But of course, from technological uh, point of view, there are challenges uh, also. Uh, I, I want to just give you a little bit of a techno business, techno economic challenge. Uh, I told you already that there is a lot actually going on in terms of making creation of the content, capture of the content, manipulation of the content, and distribution of all sorts of content easier and easier and easier. But there is incentive behind most of these because basically consumers, they pay uh, products uh, in order to be able to capture or consume this kind of content, even sometimes through, uh, for the distribution, there is some sort of uh, price they pay, if not even monetary. Uh, unfortunately, the amount of um, incentive for the countermeasures is not at the same level. So there is a little bit of a discrepancy 
between um, between the incentives are of of actually making um, a seamless media uh, creation, consumption, distribution. Um, uh, when you compare it to protecting the um, the, um, the the type of things like like against um, um, fake uh, news and fake media, so that needs also to be resolved. And again, um, uh, this becomes even more more challenging because not any manipulation is malicious. Um, any picture that you use um, has some sort of manipulation in it, and often for for very very good news. Um, here, I just want to show you uh, the example of manipulations that you can do using AI, which is not bad at all. Uh, here, uh, you, you see actually on the upper right uh, part of the picture, just a very old, uh, bad quality uh, frame of the first uh, video of this train, famous train coming in, in, a, in a station. And uh, it was very low resolution, black and white, very noisy. And what I'm showing you on this video, that I hope you see well, is a version where not only through artificial intelligence you have color, colorized it, but also boosted its resolution to 4K. Uh, so these kind of things are, are, are not malicious, right? Uh, but of course, it's debatable uh, whether this kind of content um, should be just literally pretended that it's the original, right? Because somebody and some of these pixels uh, in, in this 4K per frame are, are, are synthesized by artificial intelligence. Is it really what, what happened or is it just the guesswork of the, of the AI system that was used? And this is where JPEG really um, is now playing a role. Um, let me remind that the most fundamental reason JPEG exists is to make standards that either support or enable interoperable imaging ecosystems. And um, uh, of course, uh, dealing with the issue of security and uh, fake media is, is part of this uh, many, many of the ecosystems. Uh, but um, uh, JPEG has, a, has, a, has a, probably uh, quite an original way of, um, of defining what is a fake media. Uh, a fake media to JPEG uh, is not necessarily for bad purposes. In fact, it does not even um, uh, pretend to, um, uh, to define a fake media uh, for good or bad purpose. It just wants to, um, to, uh, to, um, to announce, to identify in a very clear and, and verifiable and reliable way if a media has been uh, um, uh, manipulated or not, and whether this modification has been malicious or uh, it has been just uh, uh, in a benign is, is something that, that JPEG does not actually um, um, uh, aims to, um, uh, to, uh, to resolve. And, um, of course, um, the key objective of, of this activity um, is to allow those who want, those who modify media uh, for whatever purpose, if they want to, to, um, to, to inform the consumers or whoever is down the road in the workflow to be aware of which kind of modification have taken place, to be, to be, to be given a chance uh, through a, a standard solution uh, to find out about it. And um, one thing that definitely um, uh, is, 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 is in the scope uh, in terms of use cases is misinformation and fake news. Uh, but there are, of course, other um, applications uh, like general forgery. So it doesn't need to be only for um, deep fakes or, or, or in, the, in, the, in the broadcasting, but just you know anything, documents and insurance and KYC and uh, identity uh, theft, etc. Uh, a lot in the world of media, not necessarily for bad purpose, but uh, but maybe for uh, for for creative uh, purposes, and um, also in tracing in general. Uh, if one wants to know uh, what was the the journey of the content that they received. Um, I think I missed, yeah. So 
these, these use cases for the last two years have been looked at uh, very carefully by the JPA committee. And uh, through these use cases, a number of requirements have been defined. Their no number is very large, but I just wanna give you just a couple so that you, you, get a, you get an understanding of what kind of requirements JPEG is looking at. For instance, the, the possibility to have a syntax that, de that defines the type of modification that has taken place. Or um, the requirement of having the uh, content um, um, the modification information, the metadata, um, protected in a very uh, secure and reliable way. Um, um, this is not a story that, uh, that is yet finished. In fact, uh, after more than two years, uh, JPEG has now, is planning to, um, in about six months, issue a first call for paper, uh, proposals. Um, uh, it's looking for in about a year from now to, to receive proposal in terms of technology it can standardize the standardization uh, starts a little bit over a year from now, and uh, in about two years uh, from now, over two years from now, we think that as far as JPEG committee is concerned, uh, the work will be done. So we will produce the draft international standard. And for those of you who know about standardization, that this thing is sent to countries uh, that are members like of IEC, and, uh, and they, they vote on this. And uh, we are hoping that by sometime, about three years from now, this this uh, this this will be this will be done, and uh, we will have an international standard. Let me finish by just uh, uh, reminding that uh, well, history of uh, fake media is is something really that is into making. It has uh, been going on for two uh, for two centuries, but it has become and has accelerated very recently for the reasons I told you, it's still a moving target. And one of the reasons the JPEG committee is not really rushing into standardizing something too quickly is that we don't wanna standardize something that would, um, that would, uh, that would become obsolete too quickly. And um, as the history of JPEG shows, uh, we are into making standards that, that last for decades um, um, and not just for, for a year or two and that need to be to be um, standardized. Uh, 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 the, the other point that is also very important to mention, and Michael, uh, the next uh, uh, speaker of this webinar, I'm sure is gonna tell about, uh, more about this, is that, of course, visual is not everything. There are challenges for uh, anything fake news that is based on text, also uh, voice also, and in fact, a combination of uh, hypermedia as, as people call. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's was the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the information I wanted to share with you. I hope it wasn't too long, but I, I didn't, uh, take, uh, but I think I had to take about 30 minutes. Um, and, um, let me stop here and see if there are any reactions. Professor Ibrahimi, thank you very much for that fascinating overview of, uh, the world of, uh, of, of fakes. Um, my takeaways from uh, are, are that uh, all manipulated images are in fact fakes, and that can be for legitimate purposes as well as for malicious purposes. So your objective is not to stop fake media, but rather to, to make uh, it more transparent. Is, is that fair? That's perfectly correct, indeed. And in order to do that, you have to convey this information um, together uh, with the with the content, and uh, the same way, you need a format in order to be able to to uh, to open and watch a format. If it's visual, if it's audio, to listen to it, you also need to have a format for this additional information. So that's that's one of the one of the challenges. How uh, how to have a versatile but also interoperable format, and the second challenge that JPEG is looking at is how can you also provide technology that make this, this information uh, uh, keep its integrity? So the people don't go and just, you know, go and the same way they manipulate and change uh, an image, they also go and change the metadata uh, that, that conveys this kind of information about which kind of changes were applied to, uh, to the content. Thank you very much. Yeah, Jan Henrik, I believe we have uh, one or two questions. 
Yes, thanks, Mike. Uh, we had indeed some questions. Um, uh, there's one question. How do you stop fake media being accompanied by fake metadata? We don't. We don't. Uh, we don't. Um, uh, so as I said, uh, the metadata, uh, uh, fake metadata is not uh, really something that the JPEG committee is doing. So it's a challenge too. Uh, to, to avoid having um, a fake uh, metadata in general, fake text in general. Uh, but, um, but as far as uh, what JPEG is doing, um, we just secure, right? So you need the ways, the same way um, you, you have the digital signature that would prove uh, uh, who, who sent an email and that this email content has not been changed the same tools. So it's not that we are coming up with new tools that nobody had heard about. There are in, in fields like finance and, uh, and the World Wide Web and uh, secure communication in general, a lot of tools that can be used um, for the purpose of securing the metadata that goes and conveys which kind of manipulations have taken place uh, since the content was generated or captured. Um, um, uh, these tools, as I said, they exist just that you need to, to, um, to find an interoperable, an agreement, a conventional way of doing that so that everybody knows because if different companies or different users, they do just their own way, well, the information might be there, but you don't know uh, how, to, how to understand it. Of course, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question here. Um, is there a way to find which JPEG picture is fake or original? I think you, you mentioned this already. Yeah. So um, you see, this is, this is the problem. The problem is that as soon as you manipulate something, it doesn't make it fake necessarily, right? Um, in fact, uh, we all have mobile phones and I, I, I dare to say all our mobile phones have a camera. And I dare even to say that all of them generate a JPEG picture. Now the JPEG picture that is generated from the sensor of a camera goes already inside the camera through a lot of manipulations. First of all, the sensor itself doesn't have all the RGB, red, green, blue. You, you have something called buyer pattern, meaning that some of the pixels in some colors, you don't even know what they are. So your camera actually guesses what they are by making interpolation, etc. So already here, um, about two thirds of the information that is captured from your camera, not even yet compressed, is fake in a way, because it's generated, right? It it wasn't it wasn't captured. You just we just uh, the camera just guessed it. And uh, so we cannot say it's fake, right? Immediately, uh, probably most people wouldn't even agree with that. Um, but we need to inform the users that this happened. Now the user, even uh, regarding the context and the application will decide whether this is acceptable or not to them. But this information is important to convey, but we are not gonna patronize nor nor, nor decide for the user whether this manipulation is acceptable for them or not. Somebody maybe wants to have fun and even they take something that is qualified as fake as a fun experience and just they know it's fun, it's just fake. They don't take it for, for reality, but they will still enjoy it. So fake is not necessarily even bad, right? There are a lot of examples in the recent years of movies being made with using fake content, special effect by itself that has been in, in Hollywood for, for, for quite some time is somehow creating fake information, right? Um, uh, so, uh, so, but it's not necessarily bad as long as you know it's fake uh, in the sense that it's a special effect. It didn't come out of a camera. Absolutely. So in this case, uh, signalization gives uh, adds some transparency, but but uh, yeah, uh, just enhances the message. And uh, one more question um, here to take uh, from from the panel: Is there any internet regulation on on fake media? Just a quick answer. Well, unfortunately, if you are talking about just having um, the general um, uh, internet, well, we don't have any any. 
any rules around uh, fake news, etc. that some countries they have. Uh, I had one slide, didn't have time to talk about it. Maybe I can, I can answer in more details offline. But the answer is that some countries are actually putting legislations. Some countries are interpreting existing legislations in the context of the fake news, etc. But it's true that um, it's it's very very variable. Uh, some some places in the world, uh, because of the nature of the government, uh, they don't see any problem really imposing uh, and constraining things on on their citizens. Some countries are much more careful before doing that. Um, we probably need some sort of supranational um, rules like GDPR, right? GDPR, I think one can say it has been relatively a good success in terms of protecting privacy of people. We need something similar and uh, efforts are being done. There is nothing concrete uh, yet in this direction. Uh, and I'm not really quite frankly the expert in that either. I'm not a lawyer nor a legislator, but um, but of course with I talk uh, through my hat as uh, being a university professor, but also as my hat of being the chair of the JPEG committee, a lot with people who, who are also into um, making the proper application of the law and law enforcement and legislations. Um, and I, I know there are things going on, um, but I uh, there, none, none of it is really supranational yet. Some countries are doing some things. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Turas Ibrahimi, uh, and I hand back to Michael Lane. Thank you very much, Jan Henrik. And uh, our next guest, uh, Mikhail Wegner, is a journalist at uh, ARD in, in Germany. Um, um, and Michael, I saw you nodding your head vigorously when uh, Professor Ibrahimi said that uh, humans have a tendency to share information without verifying it, which I guess is why ARD have employed you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mike. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, uh, exactly. That's uh, that. That is the problem because uh, we all uh, pictures and uh, as uh, Professor Ibrahimi said, pictures are so powerful. Moving images are so powerful in conveying those uh, those ideas that you know uh, we are so much focused on that, and so it's very easy to share them, very easy to believe them. And I want to show you with uh, this little presentation how we, as a public broadcaster, who's built on trust because people come to us because they trust us, how we uh, really uh, have found ways now to verify to authenticate indicate that what is really uh, being said and what has been shared, if that's really accurate, if that's really true or not. So that's my little presentation to you here today. Can we see those slides? Yep. Thank you very much. Yes. So I told you uh, I'm from the uh, German public broadcaster ARD and uh, that is a, a big broadcaster that I want to show you on the next slide, uh, where uh, we are based, uh, we are here in Germany, uh, ARD, this is our logo, we are the so-called first uh, national television, that's why you see the little one above there. The news program that we produce in Hamburg, that's where I speak to you from, is called Tagesschau. So it's uh, our news program, it's kind of like a daily show, daily summary of events that we have been giving for the last 60 years already. Now, I show you a little picture of our newsroom up there. That's what it looks like in normal times, not like now in Corona times where a lot of us are uh, really unlikely away. And uh, we have to say that uh, this is uh, also a picture of our studio below uh, uh, where our anchors present the news. Now, we are the most watched news bulletin in Germany. We produce up to 20 bulletins per day. We have an all news program, Tagesschau 24. We are, of course, also on the internet, tagesschau.de, on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to asking people why they watch us, then, uh, you know, when we come to the polls, when we talk to them, they say, we come to you because we trust what you report. We are, when we believe the polls, the most trusted news, and that gives us special responsibility. 
special responsibility when it comes to fake news. Now, this is a very good example as uh, Turash has shown earlier, fake news spreads so easily because it's shocking, isn't it? When we heard in 2015, Pope Francis endorses Donald Trump for president, everybody was shocked and everybody was sharing that, but it was fake news. Give you another example uh, from Germany here. There were pictures, there were videos, very strong videos, uh, and the news that went around with it, a thousand men mob attack police and set Germany's oldest church on fire on New Year's Eve. Well, it was actually fake news because it was just uh, uh, people celebrating with, you know, we always have fireworks on New Year's Eve. So uh, it, it, something went on fire, but it was not a mob attacking the police and uh, setting the church on fire. Fake news taken out of the uh, general meaning. So that's fake news is really something that we all really find every day. And the really bad thing is with fake news, I circled this down there for you on the right. Fake news spreads even faster than real news. The total engagement, you see this on the top stories, on the top stories from a few years ago, and that's still true for today. There's more interaction. If that's fake news, there's more interaction there's more reaction because it's, oh, did you see this? Isn't this incredible? People share it easily like that. So that's, you know, that means fake news is a real problem for us as broadcasters when we are dependent on bringing trustworthy news to our viewers. Now, you've seen fake news is a problem, but we still need social media as a source of information as a broadcaster. Why? Because you see this, and uh, Professor Iberini has had the same pictures there. All of us, and he has just said that, have cameras, have, have our phones always with us. So we're always up with our cameras, taking those shots of everything that happens around us. For us as a broadcaster, that's a very good thing. You, why? Because we can't have our correspondents or cameramen everywhere in the whole world, but we can find this. So we need photos and videos from the social media, we need this, but we need to make sure that they are really authentic, that they really show what they say they show. And now I wanna share with you how we do this. We have developed at AID News here, Tagesschau, a workflow for social media content. And all social media content that comes in here that we use to present our viewers is going through this workflow. I want to explain to you now how we go through this. And I think this will be interesting for you because it's a view behind the scenes a little bit, how we deal with this. We have set up a four-step verification of UGC, UGC saying user-generated content. So we have a four-step verification process and I wanna walk you through it. And I call it sometimes a trial. You know why? Because we put every story from social media all photos, all videos through this trial. And we put them on trial and we ask, really, is this picture true? Can it be true? How fake is it or is it really authentic? And how do we do this in these four steps? First, the ver we verify the basic metadata. Where was it photoshopped? When was it shot? What can you see on it? Who can you see on it? I will show you some examples just in a minute. The second step is the verification of the source. We know the normal source, our cameraman. Yes, we can trust the, them because they work for us, but we don't know all the people who have uploaded their photos on social media. So we need to verify the source. Third step is the verification with the help of experts. And the database that we have developed for that is very important. I will show you how it works in just a minute. And last but not least, I will show you also methods of technical verification where you can with technical software analyze pictures and find out things very much uh, as, as, as Professor Ibrahim just explained. Now, let's go to the first step. Let's to go to what we do when we see some video or some photo coming in. We look to verify the time and the location of a photo or a video or a document. So what does this photo or video show? Is it consistent with material or claims from other sources? 
for instance. You know, there's, uh, there's fighting going on in Syria. And you will see a lot of examples in my talk about Syria because why? We don't, we, our correspondents don't all the time have access to that area because there's war. So we are very dependent on the social media. But we have to make sure that uh, when pictures come up, that also we have other reports saying actually something has been happening there. You know, so that already is a first first uh, uh, sign for if it's fake or not. So we look at uh, a second fact, where has the photo been shot? Is it really the place? Is that really the city of Homs or Aleppo? If we stay in Syria, is this really the place? We look for it, of course, and I will show you a few examples in a minute. When was the material filmed? Is that really from today? Or is it old material that has been reused and re-upload to the internet? We look at who we can see on the photo and video, and we look very much also at how was the material shot, exactly as Professor Ibrahimi said, with what kind of camera does it have metadata and why not? So let's look at a few examples. This is a picture that we found on social media. And it said in the accompanying text with it, uploaded, and it was on the day after the Scottish independence vote in September 2014. Look, these are pictures that we have just shot on the streets of Edinburgh. Look at this, what happened? And we were shocked. We hadn't seen pictures like this from our correspondent who was there. We said, wow, are these, uh, 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 wow, he, he, these are different pictures. But we wanted to make sure, and that's what we do every time. And I'll show you what we did. It's actually very easy. We uploaded this material to an image reverse search, like Google image reverse search, TINI search. You can use any reverse search uh, machine for that. And it takes 0 0.1 seconds. And it will say if this photo that you uploaded has had a history on the internet already. Has it been used before? And yes, within a very short time, we found all those examples down there that this picture actually has been uploaded three years before, not showing the Edinburgh riots, but showing the riots in London in August 2011. That's the first step we always do. When every material comes in, we let it go through image reverse search to really see, is this current? Has this been used before? Is it from today or not? And with this, we can already sort out 90% of the pictures because old pictures are reused and reused always again. Now, what do we do with the video? I bring you an example from Syria. You see a terrible destruction there in Syria in those days. And we have to ask ourselves, not only with photos, but also with video because we are a television broadcaster. Is this from today? I advise you to, to use this. It's a free instrument developed by Amnesty International. I give this to you because you can also fight it and try it later. You can upload a video on YouTube into this YouTube data viewer. And what this instrument does is just very easy. It makes little photos, the most important frames out of a video. And then you can send those photos again through the image reverse search. And you can find out very quickly again, has this been on the internet already? Is this old or is this from today? Now, is this really concrete evidence? We don't know, but it's a little stone in this trial process that I explained to you earlier, a little stone and we add stone to stone. Now, we have talked a lot about when this material was shot, another very helpful instrument, also something that you can try is another free tool on the internet. And they give you all kinds of clues when material was really shot, when it was uploaded. This one is called Wolfram Alpha. And why is it helpful? Because with Wolfram Alpha, you can find out all kinds of things about uh, something. For instance, let's say the example of Edinburgh. Uh, let's say we have an, a picture from the day and you see uh, on the photo of, uh, that is supposedly today that the sun is shining in Edinburgh. Now, we all know that Scotland and rains quite often, and apologies for all of you who are, who are from there. But, you know, you want to make sure, is that really from today? So you just go to this little machine and ask them, how is the weather today in Scotland? Or how has it been on, on the day that we want to look at three years ago? And it will, within no time, tell you it was sunny weather, it was raining. And so there we can already show, oh, on the picture, it's sunny. But what from Alpha tells you, it was raining, actually. 
it's a good good idea. We have all kinds of other instruments like sun pelt. Where where is the sun standing? Is it what kind of shadows does it have to produce? Is it high? Is it low? And all those things. But you know, uh, this this is uh, just one uh, one of the examples of the instruments we use. Now, we also want to find out where some footage was shot. Is it really that city? I have never been to Homs or to Aleppo in Syria. I don't know those places. I can't tell you. But many other people have been. So we just, again, go to the internet, go to photo collections like Panoramio, Google Maps, whatever. You find the one that is best, uh, best for you and that has the most photos. And there you can find out, is that really that street corner where something is supposed to have happened? Let's say there is an attack uh, outside the synagogue. You can find that place on older photos and see, ah, look, does this synagogue, does this mosque, does this church look like the one in the, in the video that was sent to us? And with this help, we can verify, we can, again, find out more about this place. So we use that a lot. Now, we have talked a lot about these first metadata, but we also said uh, that we have to check the source. How trusted is the source? Have we worked with the source before? How high is the frequency of posting? How many followers does the source have? Something, some, when you find a social media account where there's just a few followers, you start to be skeptic because how, you know, this is not very likely that, that it, it was just a few followers, this goes on. So when we see that, we already are skeptical. It's no evidence again, but it's a little step. It's a little s s a step in this trial that I've explained to you earlier. We look at the how, how posts are discussed in the social community. So if someone uploads something, you know, from Syria, for instance, and if you look at the commentary below there and see that people have said, oh, this is not, this hasn't happened all. This is totally unbelievable. Then, then, then we are also more, uh, you know, more inclined to look further and see if that's what we think. We look, what do other players say about the source? Do they report about the same? contacts uh, about the same topics and why not and last but not least we always try to contact the source directly to ask those questions to themselves i'll give you a few examples now for instance i talked about how trusted is the source this is a source amc it stands for aleppo media center that we work a lot with uh, that we used to work a lot with during the conflict in syria and uh, whenever we saw that uh, branding on a video that we found on social media, we were already relieved because we knew the source. We had trusted it before. We had seen that it was always right, that it didn't give us old pictures, that it didn't give us pictures that were not from that place, but that they were right. Is this again another, uh, is this a hard evidence? No, it's not. Of course, this time it could be right, but at least you had another stone. And with all these other, you understand now this trial process that I want to explain, it's step by step you go with that. On this video also you see, I have circled it below there in red, you see a t-shirt and it says white helmets on it. Well, we had seen and known about this organization, about the white helmets a long time. And so we knew that they uh, were always there and that they were always involved in helping the people there. So we knew already that the, that was a trusted organization, the white helmets. So that made us more secure. We often also look, and, and I said this uh, earlier, we look at what do other sources say. We do not only take one example, but we look around and see, do others report the same thing? Up there again, it's the same picture of the destroyed house. And we found the same picture just shot from the other side, from a source that we trust because these are professional uh, journalists from AFP below. So Agence France Presse showed the same picture as it was on the social media and said it was shot on the same day. So that helped us to verify that picture already. The third step I explained to you earlier is asking the experts. Unluckily, I do not speak Arab. I don't, don't speak Chinese, but we have to verify pictures from those, those regions where this is spoken. I've never been to Homs or Aleppo in Syria, but I still have to verify. So what helps me is to ask the experts of a country, a region, a language or a topic. For instance, what weapons are used? What kind of tank is that that you see there? And luckily, we report a lot from crisis regions, so we have to answer those questions very often. So experts can be colleagues from the region, colleagues from other broadcasters, international networks of verifiers, trustful users, and so on 
and so forth. So who are our experts? Well, first of all, our own correspondence. And I have shown you, I show you here, for instance, our correspondence throughout the world. We have 26 offices around uh, the world. And so these people are much closer than we are. They speak the uh, local language or their producers speak the local language. And so when we have a question, when we say, what are they shouting there? Or what's written on this, uh, on this, on this logo or on the sign that they hold up? We, we refer to them and say, can you help us translate that? Is this, does this look like Cairo? Well, I don't know, but um, our Cairo uh, correspondent will know for sure and will be able to help us and say, no, that doesn't look at all like this. So that's very helpful. Our network goes further. We have a, a cooperation with the also Geneva-based European Broadcasting Union, the EBU. And they have built up uh, on our initiative a few years ago, a user-generated content verification network. Because the idea is the same, because we all are public broadcasters and we all need the same trusted material. We all can't be wrong because then people won't come to us and won't trust us anymore. So this is just an example. You know, the BBC, will very likely look for the same pictures uh, to verify as we, as ARD, or as the French, or as the Italians, as the Norwegians, as the Swedish, and so on and so forth. So this is a very, very useful network where we all share our results because someone might have find out or uh, found out already that this is an old picture, not true, taken out of context, then we do not have to do the same work again. We can share our results. Now, even larger than Europe, there's international networks. And this is just one of them, First Draft. We are members of that. Other quality uh, media are members of that as well, like Washington Post, The New York Times, CNN, and so on and so forth. So even also on the international level, we have a lot of partners where we share our results and hear from them as well what is fake and what is not. Last but not least, I told you, we do sometimes of some kind of technical verification. So we find out what does the metadata see? When was the picture taken? Because metadata is, of course, Professor Ibrahim explained, as you all know, is always attached to a, to a photo. So what does the metadata reveal? Have photos been altered or ma ma uh, manipulated at a later stage? Have photos been shot by the mentioned cameras? Have the metadata been altered? Have they been erased? And why? You know, that makes you already suspicious. And of course, we look at EXIF data and at image error level analyzers. I want to show you on the next slide one example of that. You see this picture on the left. And of course, we all know it's fake. It's a UFO hovering about a city. Of course, we don't believe in UFOs. But how do you find that out technically? You run it through a machine, this, this one, another free tool on the internet is called Forensically. We run this photo through the machine and what you see is that on the lower side, on the lower picture, you see that the UFO is actually in this purple, bluish purple color. So you see, ah, that's a little hint. It's another stone in our verification process that this was added to the photo later. So this machine can help you to see, really see. And actually there's something in the upper, upper hand corner, I don't know if you can see it, but they, on the original picture, they have also added a parachute. I would have never saw, seen that, but the machine highlighted the parachute there. And so we can use that a lot, run those photos sometimes through these technical machines to the software and that helps a lot to see if some picture or video has been altered. Now, last but not least, I want to give you an insight how we practically work. How does it work? So I give you an insight, uh, a story from the Ukraine. Because again, the Ukraine, uh, you remember there was a big war there. There's still uh, war activity there. And our correspondent, again, as I said, has no access to that area. So we are again reliant on social media, on user-generated content. So we found this on the left side, this tweet on Twitter by Christopher Miller. And he says, look, this, I upload this video. This just happened in Kramatorsk, a, a city in the Ukraine. And apparently the airport has been targeted. So what did we do? We looked at the video. Now on the right side, I made a still for you out of this video. And I circled already what we found. We wanted to find out where was this video shot. So when you want to find those things out, you look very much at the things that, that you can see in there. 
to place them. So what we find out, I circled it for you, and it's hard to see probably from what but I explained it to you, it's a water tower. It's a standalone water tower that, well, that's bizarre. You don't find those things very often. So let's see if we can find it. Let's look at the next slide. So yes, we did find this water tower. On Google Maps, we found it on, and in other location. We found the water tower standing not too far from the airport. That's where the shooting was, you know, has, has, ha has happened, they said. And we could locate it in several ways. And if you look at the lower right picture, we found the water tower that was not close from the airport. And we, I, I put this triangle, this black triangle in there. And it shows you that we look back, this is the water tower in the foreground. So going back from this triangle, where could the camera man have taken this photo? Where could he have stood? And so we, we, you know, we found out, oh, this, this is the area where this could have been, where, where this could have been taken from. Now, we wanted to find out more. We wanted to know who's the uploader because we wanted to have contact and really talk to her. So we went and he saw the original tweet was by Christopher Miller. But normally when you find this on Twitter, this is never the original source. So we tried to find through going through several uh, search machines, the original uh, post. And we came to that one up on the right there. It says Kramatos, which is again, in Cyrillic, the, uh, the, the city down there. And we found this Mrs. Yearly. She had this account on YouTube and we found this was the earliest source that we could find. And when you ran Mrs. Dilly again, you could find a lot of information about her. For instance, I've uh, posted that below there, where she lives, she lives in Kramatorsk. Good sign, she's apparently in that city where she has taken the video. Is this another hard evidence? No, it's not, but it's another step in the direction to verify material. We could find out, well, wow, she shares all of kind of things, uh, which I find still amazing, that people share the, the names of, <laughs> of their sons and daughters and their birth. It's terrible. But for us, it's helpful because she also shared her phone number, her contact information. We found out her email. And with this email, we could again contact her. And we could also find out where she lives and guess where, where she lives. She lives in this where the arrow goes up to the little thing on Kramatorsky Boulevard, exactly where the places where the cameraman must have stood from our little triangle that we built to take that picture. Wow, that was great. Now, this took us four and a half hours. This whole process took us four and a half hours. Well, because we had to answer a lot of questions. We had to find the original. We had to go, go through, you know, look at the location. We had to look at the weather, we had to look at other things, you know, we had to, you know, do all those things. We wanted to contact them, the source. We did contact the source, did get the permission to show this video because we just cannot, even as a broadcaster, not take everything from the internet and just broadcast it. So we did get the permission, but we also had a chance to ask her and ask her, is this really shot? Did you shoot that? When did you shoot it? We could ask her the question. She gave us the permission. So that's a good result for us. And it, you know, it's a lot of work, but in the end, it's, it's very well made work and it's very good to have that work because it, it, it's clear then to our bulletin editors and to our viewers that we put a lot of work to really verify the source and verify that this is really authentic material. Now, to end this all up, I brought this little list for you, and I think this, this could be helpful because it actually summarizes a little bit what I said. It's not made by myself. It's made by actually librarians. Yes, from an old library, believe it or not. But they are really exactly there what we need to do. I think it can be helpful for you when you come across fake news to use that. So it will summarize all what I said. Consider the source. Look who is behind there. Check the author. Who is this person? Is this, you know, is he on a, is, is he well known? Is he respected? Or is this totally new and has just come up with that? Check the date. We have talked about that. You know, look, look when some, some story was posted, when some video, is it really from today? Or is it taken out of context? Is it seven or eight years old? Check your own biases. That's always good. It's always good not to believe something that, oh, you think, oh, yes. 
of course, that confirms what I always thought about, you know, uh, this or that. Check your own biases. Read beyond. Make sure, you know, that, as we said with the other sources, with Agence France Presse, don't only take one source. Take two or three sources. What do other sources say? Supporting sources. Look at it. Is it a joke? Yes. Many things, and Professor Ibrahimi said that, some things are just good and people want to, want to enjoy it. But uh, uh, so, so it can be just a joke and uh, it's uploaded because of that. And last, of, uh, last but not least, and I've told you that as well, ask the experts, ask uh, you know, the people who know better, who know region better, language better. And then I think you're on the safe side. This was, and I hope uh, you uh, enjoyed a little uh, view behind the scenes of how we deal with fake media, with fake news and with fake videos and photos. Thank you very much for your attention and happy to take any of your questions. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, a, a, a fascinating look at uh, the verification process inside newsrooms. Thank you very much for describing the, uh, the various steps. I suppose a, a question that comes to mind is, Typically, how long does it take you to, to verify that a, that a photo or a video is in fact uh, authentic? It's very, very different, uh, I have to say. And it depends all on how well your database is organized already. Because if you have done a lot of verification from, from one region, one country, let's say Syria or Ukraine, you know a lot of experts. You know already who to ask. If you wake me up in the middle of the night and show me the city of Homs, and I don't see the typical line of mountains in the background, I will tell you, no way. Mm. So, you know, if you're very often uh, in a region, in, in, in an area, in a country, then it's, then it's a lot faster. Then you have your experts, you have your metadata, everything very close. So it can be very fast. If you come to a new country, a new region, a new topic, it can take a very long time. And of course, the bulletin editors are always saying, I need those pictures. I need to show to our viewers because we want to be fast as well. But uh, we generally think that as public media, our responsibility is to make sure that the people get the trusted news, that they can trust us, that they can really only uh, say that. And so when we are not sure, we will always say, you know, this is supposed to have been shot in Kramatorsk. We will almost make that sure. And four and a half hours later, the result of our work is just the change of two words. Those two, two words as this is from Kramatorsk. You know, so that's uh, that's a lot of work behind it, but I think people see that, and uh, again, that's why people come to us and uh, uh, and 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 still still watch us. And we are still uh, one of uh, we are still the most watched um, uh, news program in Germany. A, a quick question, and then, and then I have uh, uh, somebody who would like to ask you a question. Um, how often do you get it wrong? Yeah, we get it wrong sometimes. But, you know, the more we have done, the better we get. Because from every mistake, we learn what, when something goes wrong. Well, we have had that. We have had this once, twice, three times. And uh, so, so, so it's actually a very good thing for us to look back and then say, what, why did we get it wrong? What do we have to make better? What did we overlook? And it, it makes us so much better because next time you won't do the same mistake again. And, you know, of course, we, we then exchange with, and the, the more we exchange with others, the EBU, again, the European Broadcasting Union, is very helpful in, in helping us. The, the worldwide alliances that I mentioned are very helpful. So uh, lately, we have been uh, quite right. But again, 80%, 90% of the material we get already with the image reverse search, we already know, is it from today? And so much has been taken out of context and uploaded again because videos and photos uh, uh, share uh, uh, much easier to share. They get a much wider audience. And so people just upload old material. And so we don't fall for it. And I have to say, I'm happy to say that uh, we know more other broadcasters in Germany who have got it more wrong than we have. Great. You, you, you're doing a wonderful job. I wonder if we could uh, unmute uh, Professor Ibrahimi's uh, microphone. Um, he has a question for you, Michael. Michael, really fascinating. Um, one of the good things about organizing this kind of webinars is that uh, also the, 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 the speakers and the panelists learn things. And uh, I, I personally learned a lot. Thank you very much for, 
for such a such a great uh, uh, example. I have a question. Uh, you are, of course, <laughs> much more expert in this area, and you know very well that fact checking uh, has been always part of uh, any broadcaster and newscaster. Um, how do you see in the last twenty years? Although fact checking goes back maybe 100 years. In the last 20 years, how do you see um, fact-checking has evolved? And more importantly, where do you see the trends of fact-checking are? Where, where, where do you see it is going? Uh, thank you for that question. And actually, uh, you, you already came from there because in, I, I did really enjoy your, uh, your report because it was exactly pinpointing to the, uh, to the question you're asking now. Uh, I think uh, in the last 20 years, 15 years ago, all this process didn't exist at AID News. You know, it, it, it just didn't exist because social media was something, oh yeah, we would pay some, post something on Facebook where we would not take it as a source. We have so many more people, as you said in your, uh, in your report, we have so many more people these days who are, who are, who are able to, to upload something, to shoot material and to use it. So, it's a, the, it's a huge amount. So, you know, the quantity has increased so much of the material that we can find. And that, you know, is actually also used by people to, to, to manipulate you, to, to show this in a, in a certain way. The difference is that 20 years ago, we had like five, six trusted sources. We had the main news agencies that we would work with our main correspondents. We had the other broadcasters. We would exchange material. We could be sure that, you know, they work with the same things. These days, we can't be sure of anything because the majority, the majority of the material that we, that we use from the social media has to be checked because it's coming from everywhere and there's so much vested interest in this. And I can understand it. If I lived in Syria, and were, was in these terrible conditions. I would hold up my phone and, 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 and want to illustrate how bad things are for me. So, and if I don't have the right pictures, I will use the pictures from three months ago or seven years ago, just to show show how much I suffer. But, you know, it's very understandable from that, that point of view. But for us as broadcasters, it's very important to, to make sure that we don't, um, you know, that, 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 that we distinguish between facts, and uh, you know, uh, uh, terrible, terrible uh, things that, that happen there. But we have to make sure that we get the facts right. So, a lot more sources, a lot more work, a lot more ways to ask our questions. I hope I, I answered your question a little bit. And we also have a question from my colleague Sylvia Corsak. Hi. It was it was just so fascinating to listen to you both. It's really fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I'm just wondering, in terms of history of journalism, I know that, you know, photos were always manipulated. I remember the famous photo of Abraham Lincoln that wasn't actually with his body and, and kind of photographers are probably used to that in history. But I'm very curious as to how social media has changed the perceptions of readers. Do you see the general awareness of fake media possibly has increased? Do you see your readers calling out media that could be fake, supporting you in the process that you just described? Thank you very much for that question, Sylvia. I think it uh, really pinpoints to, to, to the question. And uh, Ibra, uh, Professor Ibrahimi just did the same thing. Uh, he, he just said, you know, it's not only a legal challenge or a technical challenge. It's much more an educational challenge, a social challenge to make people aware. And, you know, I see this, and, and it makes me it makes me happy to see that our younger generation, what, what they are taught in school, that there is much more media awareness these days being taught. Something that you know uh, wasn't there. You know, twenty years ago, again, you could take anything that you would read or hear on television, on on, on, on newspapers, radio. You could take for granted most of it. You know, was was you know it was mostly the public media. And, and it was mostly mo mostly clear that they that they had gone with their correspondence and uh, and sources, but that's not the case anymore. Kids have to kids especially, but also grown up have to be made aware that there is a lot of things around, and that they have to be careful. That they have to be careful that you just cannot trust everything. What I tell my colleagues is, is sometimes actually I think that we should tell everyone. I 
tell my colleagues, just be careful. Don't trust, don't trust, uh, don't trust everything you see. You know, very often it's too good to be true. You know, it's, that's, that's the first thing. You know, if you see something that, wow, you know, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's take two steps back. And yes, just use our journalistic qualification that we got to ask those questions, to ask those questions that are explained to you. Where, when, what? Don't, don't, don't let your brain sp be switched off just by a strong picture. Because that's, you know, that's what happened. We see this, wow, this is amazing. We want to share this. And, uh, 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 and then you, 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 know, you enter into the same problem area that you are also participating in sharing those things because you didn't check it. So that's the one thing I think that uh, it's, it's a big challenge, but I see more and more uh, um, uh, efforts in that direction that people are. And this, this last slide that I showed you from the lab, library is, is, is clear. You know, it's spreading more and more around that we all have to learn to be super careful not to believe everything that's just around. And I think it's, it's, it's going to the right, the right direction. And our readers, our, our viewers challenge us as well. Yes, of course they come and say, is that really uh, correct? Did you do that? And they, they, they will figure things out. So we have to be careful because they are very vigilant as well. And that's good because we, we, like, we like to be you know, um, in that position that we can say, yes, we are, we are sure that, that we have done the right thing here. So uh, Professor Ibrahim has just raised his hand. Um, we'll, we'll go back to him, him quickly. And after that, I'd like to ask uh, Jan Henrik if we've uh, received any more questions. So first, uh, Professor Ibrahimi. Yeah, just as a follow-up to what Mikhail said, which is absolutely correct. Uh, we are also in parallel with that, um, also uh, following a very dangerous trend, you could say even. Uh, and that's that uh, the younger generation um, they actually are used to always manipulate. And I'm not talking about the benign manipulations uh, uh, that, uh, that I mentioned, uh, like denoising or uh, super resolution, et cetera, but really making, making contents really become very different. Uh, as a user of social media, I usually, when I take a picture, uh, well, whatever my camera does, uh, I, I take it, maybe <laughs> frame it a little bit and then, and then share it. My kids, they don't do that. My kids, they, they really go beautify. They use all sorts of beautifier. A lot of social uh, media, they already have um, uh, built in uh, uh, all sorts of filters, all sorts of, all sorts of things that change even the content. Um, uh, and so, so we are um, increasingly um, uh, seeing pictures that are not actually as what came out of the camera and the border between what is just a benign denoising and uh, contrast adjustment and gamma corrections and what is really changing the semantics is is blurring right so people basically you know this this we saw it a little bit to some extent in publicity where where uh, where people were were warned after a while when when they when when everybody was so nice and tidy and the uh, clothes were so nice and jewelries were so nice that, that at some point people had to say, hey, you know, this is now how, how a normal human being looks like because they have been photoshopped and, and, and don't, don't try to look like that. Uh, so the, the, the same thing now is, 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 is happening with just any content that we create. So you don't need even a professional sitting at photoshopping and creating a very nice looking silhouette um, uh, with, with everything perfect, uh, uh, which doesn't exist in reality. Um, but this is just happening, right? So people even present themselves in a, in a completely different way. This is especially true in Asia, where, uh, where people, when they take picture, they actually even change their facial features. Uh, and there are, they pay even for, for apps for their mobile phones to do that. So I think that is the, in parallel also, uh, the trend beside the education. So there is education of really being aware that the content is is, is, is not necessarily um, what came out of the camera and, and the reality, but on the other hand, the education that, uh, hey, the, the, the content, even that you yourself are creating, be careful that at some point, you know, you are just going probably too far and what you are sharing is not anymore you and your friends. They're just creating a fictive 
uh, and, and a fake history. That person is not you. Thank you very much. And just showing you that uh, fake media is, uh, is uh, possible with uh, Zoom too. I've just given myself a, a moustache. Um, yeah, yeah, Jan, I, I believe you have uh, one or two more questions. Yes, and uh, Mike, I really like your moustache. It's uh, fantastic. Yeah. So we do have a, a few. We have a few questions from the audience. Uh, one already has been answered uh, by by Michael Wigner, and that was uh, if people start more believing. But actually, he said that people are more aware, which is, I think, a good trend uh, towards the right direction. Uh, then we had a question here, a bit more in a technical direction. Is there any tools where we can see the source of creating a particular fake image or video? Michael, you have shown a, a few very interesting sources, uh, but do you do you think can think of a source or a, a tool which where you can find the source where this has been done? Uh, yeah, there's uh, not particular really. Uh, no, no, we, we we don't have that. I, I should say it's uh, when uh, when we go uh, through the uh, media that we find on on social media, then then we have to really go step by step through it. There there is nothing to uh, to uh, to have that directly. No, that doesn't. Uh, not not to my knowledge. But, but we are always learning as well. So no, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. And we have another question regarding the privacy information protection from fake images. Uh, what do you think uh, should be added to the law such as GDPR from a legal point of view? That's a question to Professor Ibrahim, I would yeah. say. <laughs> um, so uh, as you know, GDPR uh, basically is, is a law that applies mainly to citizens of the European Union. But countries like Switzerland uh, and elsewhere, uh, they, uh, they also have to obey if they deal with the citizens uh, of the European Union. Um, but this is very, very oriented to, um, to protection of the information uh, that, is, that is of personal uh, nature. Um, in the context of fake media and uh, fake news in general and disinformation, misinformation, and even malinformation, we need really, I'm not saying adding necessarily to, to the GDPR, but we need a trend because the situation is as serious, right? So the, these laws, they, they exist because the situation became very serious. Now the situation has become serious also regarding misinformation. I don't need to convince anybody there. Every day there are news stories about these things, how people have been manipulated, how elections have been rigged, how even people are refusing to vaccinate themselves uh, for uh, because of fake news. And um, uh, so, so probably some sort of legislation similar to GDPR, so supranational, not necessarily only one country. Maybe Europe would be the best place to start this uh, because Europe is like privacy has been something Europe has been uh, compared to the rest of the world has been much more sensitive. Also misinformation and uh, disinformation, Europe is, is culturally also very sensitive to that. So, and, um, so something similar where legislation is, is created that says that any information that would um, be addressed, targeting, or has been issued from uh, European Union citizens should basically follow some basic principles that, uh, and um, uh, that, that, would, uh, that would prevent the, the, the spread of this information and misinformation. Now, I'm not for policing and things like that, but I'm think that I, I, I think that at least uh, from awareness point of view um, and, and opening uh, the eyes of people, it's always good for people to know there are some laws about things, right? So if we just say, uh, you know, be kind and peace on earth and things like that, normally it doesn't tilt. But as soon as there is some legislation or something like that, people take it more seriously. And they understand also the gravity of situation better. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, um, yeah, thank you for the answer. We have another uh, very interesting question uh, related to social media and news. Um, so it seems that a lot of younger people are getting their news from social media. Um, is there a future of truth? Will social media platforms be forced to have more oversight on what they publish, Michael? 
Yes, I think they're they're they're. I'm 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 generally an optimist on those things. So uh, yes, I see good developments. I mean, first of all, um, relevant media, uh, uh, quality media on social media as well. So it you know it used to be only young people uh, on there, and uh, you know now that there's a lot of quality media in there, you have different sources of information. That's already good, as I said earlier. Don't check, please do not stay with the one source. Look at the other on the second one and the one that you generally trust. It doesn't have to be us, but just, just identify this for yourselves who could be and then rate it for yourself. So that's one thing. So I, I see there's more quality media around more sources that young people can refer to. And I think they do. And uh, secondly, yes, I see a very slow, extremely slow reaction by the big uh, networks uh, to actually police those things. You know, we have seen this lately with Facebook's actions. It's slow, it's sluggish, but finally moving into the right direction that, you know, uh, they start to, well, censor, well, yes, to take down things that they have uh, as, as seen and identify as fake news. They've built up, um, you know, offices around the world you know, there's an effort, and at least it's going to the right direction. I think we, as the public, have to push them. We have to push them, make sure that they do this. Uh, always expose it when, 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 when things happen like that. I think then uh, media regulation will become a lot stronger. But here in Germany, this is already happening, and in other countries as well. So yes, I do see uh, do see hope in that uh, that there is uh, more control about fake news being spread around uh, like it was five, six years ago. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, I give back to Mike. Thank you all uh, to, to our, our two marvelous speakers. You've taught me so much today. And thank you to uh, all our participants who've uh, stayed with us uh, through this, uh, th this long webinar. Uh, I hope uh, you'll join us again for our, our next event, which, uh, which perhaps uh, Jan can tell you about. Um, yes, thank you. So um, please have a look at uh, the IEC uh, Academy website where we uh, share our next events. So we will have uh, some, some more events coming up and uh, we are adding events as they come, as we say. So please uh, stay alert. Um, go to IECCH Academy and webinars where we publish all these uh, webinars, all these public webinars we are doing. And uh, also very interesting, if you miss one of our webinars, we always record our webinars and we make available the recording and the slides uh, and the answered question on the website. So have a look there uh, because there are continuously uh, webinars upcoming. And uh, we hope to see you soon in uh, one of our other webinars of, of uh, the IEC. Thank you, Jan, and uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye from Hamburg. Okay, bye.